The proceeding will start shortly. This morning, I joined some of the remarkable people who have been at the heart of the pandemic response at a service to mark the NHS's 73rd birthday at St. Paul's Cathedral. Together, we reflected on a year like no other for the NHS and for our country. And I know that honourable members on all sides of the House would join me in celebrating the decision by Her Majesty the Queen to award the NHS the George Cross. I can think of no more fitting tribute to the NHS. I know that everyone in this House, indeed everyone in this country, will celebrate this award. Mr Speaker, there is no greater demonstration of our high regard for the NHS than the manner in which we all stepped up to protect it. Now it is thanks to the NHS and many others that we are vaccinating our way out of this pandemic and out of these restrictions. 86% of UK adults have had at least one jab, and 64% have had two. We are reinforcing our vaccine wall of defence further still. I can tell the House that we are reducing the dose interval for under 40s from 12 weeks to 8, which will mean that every adult should have had the chance to be double jabbed by mid-September. And those vaccines, Mr Speaker, they are working. The latest data from the ONS suggests or shows that 8 in 10 adults have the COVID-19 antibodies that are so important in helping our body to fight this disease. When we look at people aged over 50, the people who got the jab earlier in the program, that figure rises to over 9 in 10. Now, Mr Speaker, allow me to set out why all of this is so important. Before we start putting jabs into arms, whenever we saw a rise in cases, it would inevitably be followed by a rise in hospitalisations and, tragically, a rise in deaths too. Yet today, even though cases are heading upwards, in line with what we expected, hospitalisations are increasing at a much lower rate and deaths are at just 1% of the figure we saw at the peak. Our vaccines are building a wall of protection against hospitalisation and jab by jab, brick by brick, that wall is getting higher. And for those people who sadly do find themselves having to go to hospital, we have better treatments than ever before. Last week on my visit to St Thomas's Hospital, clinicians were telling me just how transformative dexamethasone has been in their effort to save lives. And taken together, the link between cases, hospitalisations and deaths is being severely weakened, and this means we can start to learn to live with COVID. Now, as we do that, Mr Speaker, it's important that we're straight with the British people. Cases of COVID-19 are rising, and they will continue to rise significantly. We can reasonably expect that by the 19th of July, the number of daily cases will be far higher than today. Against this backdrop, I know that many people will be understandably cautious about easing restrictions. After many months of uncertainty, this is entirely natural. But we can now protect the NHS without having to go to extraordinary lengths that we've had to do so in the past. That's not to say that this is going to be easy, Mr Speaker. Of course, the pandemic is not over. The virus is still with us. It hasn't gone away. And the risk of a dangerous new variant that evades vaccines remains real. We know that with COVID-19, the situation can change, and it can change quickly. But we cannot put our lives on hold forever. My responsibility as Secretary of State for Health and Social Care includes helping us to turn and face the other challenges that we know that we must also address, from mental health to social care to the challenges of long COVID. I am determined to get to work on busting the backlog too, the backlog that has been caused by this pandemic, a backlog that we know 
will get a lot worse before it gets better. Now, as I said to this House, as I set out, Mr Speaker, uh, last week, I remain confident that we can move to step four in England on the 19th of July, and that the Government will make its final decision on this on the 12th of July. So today, Mr Speaker, I wish to set out further details of what step four will look like. In essence, our national response to COVID will change from one of rules and regulations to one of guidance and good sense. We will revoke all social distancing guidance, including the two-metre rule. Except <laughs> for in some specific settings, such as ports of entry and medical settings, where, of course, it would continue to make sense. It will no longer be a legal requirement to wear face coverings in any setting, including public transport. Although we will advise this as a voluntary measure for crowded and enclosed spaces. It will no longer be necessary to work from home. There will be no limits on the number of people you can meet. There will be no limits on the number of people who can attend life events like weddings and funerals, and there will be no restrictions on communal worship or singing. We will remove legal requirements on how businesses operate. Capacity caps will all be lifted, and there will be no longer be any requirement to offer table service. All businesses that were forced to close their doors will be able to open them once again. And we will lift the cap on named care home visitors so that families can come together in the way they choose to do so. Mr Speaker, Ministers will provide further statements this week on self-isolation for fully vaccinated people, including for international travel, and on restrictions in education settings, including the removal of bubbles and contact isolation in schools. Today, I can also confirm to the House that we have completed our review of certification. While already a feature of international travel, we have concluded that we do not think using certification as a condition of entry is a way to go. For people who haven't been offered a full course of vaccination and for businesses, we felt that the impact outweighed the public health benefits. Of course, Mr Speaker, businesses can use COVID, COVID status certification at their own discretion and from step four onwards, the NHS COVID pass will be accessible through the NHS app and other digital routes. This will be the main way that people can provide their COVID status, a status that will achieve once they have completed a full vaccine course, a recent negative test, or some other proof of natural immunity. Now, Mr. Speaker, taken together, step four is the biggest step of all a restoration of so many of the freedoms that make this country great. We know that as a consequence, cases will rise, just as they have done at every step on our roadmap. But this time, our wall of protection will help us, while step four will be the moment to let go for, of many restrictions. We must hold on to those everyday, sensible decisions that can help make us all safe. The responsibility to combat COVID-19 lies with each and every one of us. That means staying at home when you're asked to self-isolate. It means considering the guidance that we're setting out. And it means getting the jab, both doses, when you're offered it that you please, please take the jabs. And something that this is something that everyone can do to make a contribution towards this national effort. And it may even mean for some people that they will get three jabs in a single year. Last week, the JCVI provided interim advice on who to prioritize for a third dose. And our most vulnerable will be offered booster COVID-19 jabs from September in time for the winter. And preparing for the winter ahead is not just about COVID, but flu as well. Because of the measures in place this winter, almost nobody in the UK had flu for 18 months now. That's obviously a good thing, but it does mean that immunity from flu is down. This winter's flu campaign 
will be more important than ever. And we're currently looking at whether we can give people the COVID-19 booster shot and the flu jab at the same time. Mr. Speaker, step four is the next step in our country's journey out of this pandemic. I know that after so many difficult months, it is a step that many of us will look upon with a great deal of caution. But it is one that we will all take together, with a growing wall of defence against this virus, a wall that each and every one of us can help build higher. It's vital that each of us plays our part to protect ourselves and to protect others into better days ahead. A commendable statement to the House. Yeah. Tell the Secretary of State, Jonathan Ashworth. Great, grateful, uh, Mr Speaker. And can I uh, start by paying tribute to, uh, uh, to our NHS on its 73rd anniversary and thank again our extraordinary health and care workforce. The best birthday present they could have, of course, is a fair pay rise not the proposed real terms pay cut that is currently on offer. Now we all, Mr Speaker, want to see these restrictions end. Lockdowns are a sign of policy failure. And I hope that when he makes the final decision next week it will be based on the data, the modelling and the sage advice. But let's be absolutely clear about what he is talking about today. When only 50% of the total population across England are fully vaccinated, and another 17% partially. His strategy, as he indeed was gracious enough to concede, accepts that infections will surge further and continue to rise steeply, accepts that hospitalisations will continue to rise until they reach a peak later this summer, presumably. Some of those hospitalised will sadly die, Mr Speaker, and thousands upon thousands mostly children and younger people, but others as well, will be left exposed to a virus, mainly because they have no vaccination protection, but we also know even when double jabbed, you can catch and transmit the virus. And many of them will be at risk of serious long-term chronic illness, the personal impact of which may be felt for years to come. So even though the vaccination may have broken the link with mortality, there are still questions uh, about the link between morbidity. So as part of his strategy of learning to live with COVID, can he spell out today for the British public what that actually means? In his view, learning to live with COVID, how many deaths does he consider it is acceptable when we're living with COVID? How many cases of long COVID does he consider acceptable when we are living with COVID. And given that we know that when the COVID rates uh, circulate at high rates, that the virus can escape and evolve, uh, what risk assessment has he done of the possibility of a new variant emerging and will he publish, publish it? Now, the Secretary of State says that every date for unlocking carries risk, and that's why we need to learn to live with COVID. But we shouldn't have to take a high-risk approach we should be pushing down risk. Indeed, we mitigate against risk across society all the time. We just don't accept other diseases. We take interventions to try and prevent other diseases. So why is he collapsing all mitigations completely when he knows that the COVID rates will continue to rise? He'll be aware that Israel has reintroduced its mask mandate because of the Delta variant, so why is he planning to bin ours? Masks don't restrict freedoms in a pandemic when so much virus is circulating. They ensure that everyone who goes to the shops or who takes public transport can do so safely because wearing a mask protects others. If nobody is masked, COVID risk increases and we're all less safe. He must understand that those in the shielding community are particularly anxious. Why should they feel uh, shut out of public transport and shops because he's abandoned the mask mandate. That's no definition of freedom I recognise. And who else suffers when masks are removed? It's those working in shops, it's those who drive the buses, it's those who drive taxis, it's those who work in hospitality, it's the low paid workers who also have been without access to decent sick pay, many of whom live in overcrowded uh, accommodation, those who have been savagely disproportionately impacted 
by this virus from day one, and now he's asking them to bear the brunt of the increased risk again. So again, will he explain to us why he thinks abandoning masks is a sensible uh, pr uh, proposal to follow? Uh, uh, given that people will still need to isolate, as he recognised, and test and trace will still be opera in operation, will he accept that living with the virus will mean more so than ever that those who are sick will need to isolate themselves from the rest of society? So will he ensure that they are paid proper sick pay and isolation support to do it? Has he agreed with me it's been a monstrous failure of these past 15 months that, that isolation support has not been in place? Now, masks are effective because we know the virus is airborne. So he could, put, he could further mitigate COVID risks by insisting on ventilation standards in premises and crowded buildings. He could offer grants for air filtration systems. Instead, all we get is more government advice. Ventilation in buildings and grants to support air filtration systems doesn't restrict anyone's freedoms, Mr Speaker. And indeed, it would probably help us get some of those 400,000 children back into school who have been off school because of, because of COVID. Now, yesterday, Mr Speaker, he said he believes the best way to protect the nation's health is to lift all restrictions. Now, I know he boasts of his student years at Harvard studying pandemics, but I think he may well have missed the, tu the tutorial on infectious disease control. Because widespread transmission will not make us healthier. We're not out of the woods yet, but we do want to see lockdown end, but we need those life-saving mitigations in place. We need sick pay, local contact tracing, continued mask wearing on public transport, and ventilation in, bu in, in buildings and schools to prevent further illness. I hope when he returns next week, he has put those measures in place. Stay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the right hon. Gentleman for his uh, comments and, and just turning to those. Uh, you, first of all, the, uh, the, the decision, I think he started by saying, can he get reassurance that the final decision uh, on uh, go or no go on July the 19th, for July the 19th, which we will make on July the 12th, uh, will it be informed by uh, the, the, the very best expert data? I mean, of course it will be, just as every decision has been informed in that way. And I must say, I've only been about a week into the job, Mr. Speaker, but I'm incredibly impressed uh, by our scientists and medical advisors and public health for England and uh, take this opportunity to pay tribute to all that they have been doing. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, turning to his uh, second point about the cases and the link between cases and hospitalisation and death, I mean, this is absolutely central to the, this next step that we're taking. Uh, so case numbers are high, and as I've said, they will go higher, and they will go significantly higher, and we need to be ready uh, for that. But what is far more important is how many people are ending up in hospital and how many, sadly, are dying. And that is where the vaccines have worked alongside the treatments that, the, that we now have that we didn't have a year or so ago, and it has meant uh, that uh, the, the link between cases and deaths has been severely weakened. The last time we had 25,000 new cases a day, uh, we had around 500 deaths a day. And the level now is, um, is one thirtieth of, of that. And, uh, and I know the right honourable gentleman would welcome that and, and understand that as we move forward, there is no risk-free, absolutely risk-free way to move forward. Uh, but we do need to start returning things uh, back towards normal and learning to live uh, with COVID. His question uh, around masks, uh, again, we've taken the best public health advice and, uh, and he would know from what I've said that although we will remove all legal requirements for anyone to wear a mask in any setting, uh, we expect people to behave uh, sensibly and, and think about others uh, around them. So, for example, uh, the, the guidance will be there. So if you're on public transport, let's say in a very crowded tube, I think it would be sensible to wear a mask, not least for respect for others. Uh, but if you're the only person in a carriage uh, you know, at, at late at night on the East Coast Main Line, uh, then you can choose uh, much more easily not to wear a mask, certainly there's, because there's hardly anyone else around. So we expect people, we trust people uh, to make uh, uh, sensible decisions, and I think that's the way uh, we should move ahead. He's also asked about uh, compensation, uh, sick pay, and, uh, and he knows that many measures are in place, and we will continue to keep those under review. To the slight committee, Jeremy Hill.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I support the approach the Secretary of State is taking for the simple reason that two vote doses of the vaccine work against the Delta variant. But with 350,000 new cases daily across the world, the battle against this pandemic is far from over. Uh, does he agree that if we want to prevent another lockdown in the run-up to winter, apart from the booster jab programme, the most important thing we can do is to improve the way test and trace works? In Korea, they managed to use it to stop any lockdowns. Here, it failed to stop three lockdowns, and the head of test and trace told my committee that between 20 and 40 per cent of people were not isolating when they were asked to. So with his fresh eyes in the job, will he ask officials for new advice as to what we can do to improve test and trace to stop further lockdowns? First of all, Mr. Speaker, may I thank my right honourable friend for his uh, support in these measures. I know he speaks with uh, great experience in a uh, and I want to thank him for that. Uh, regarding uh, test, trace and isolate, uh, he's right. There are many successes over the last year that we can be proud of, but there are also many improvements, I think, that can be made as well. And uh, I, I want to tell him that I have already asked for such advice, and I look forward to talking to him about it uh, in the future. Let's go to SNP spokesperson, Dr. Philippa Whitford. Philippa. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. This pandemic is very far from over. So with cases soaring across the UK, I'm surprised the Health Secretary is planning to end all COVID measures. The Delta variant, which was allowed into the UK due to the failure of border quarantine, is twice as infectious as the original and is infecting younger age groups, including children. It also shows significant vaccine escape with only 33% protection against infection from the first dose. While receiving two doses of either vaccine dramatically reduces hospitalization, the numbers are rising, and only half the population are fully vaccinated. That means the other half are not, and many won't have that opportunity until near the end of September. The Secretary of State talks about the percentage of adults that are fully vaccinated, but he must know that isn't how herd immunity works. It's achieved by reducing the number of susceptible people in the whole population to stop onward spread of the virus. The UK government's failure to lock down last September allowed the Alpha variant to emerge in the southeast of England and spread across the UK and indeed the rest of the world. So if the Health Secretary is going to just let it rip, how does he plan to avoid generating yet another UK variant with even greater vaccine resistance? With over 150,000 people dead, why has he returned to the false narrative that COVID is just like flu? Is it just wishful thinking? And why is he planning to end even simple measures like mask wearing? He has suggested people need to just learn to live with it but appears to be completely ignoring the risk of long COVID, which is already affecting over a million people, including children. So how does he plan to avoid soaring cases of long COVID in unvaccinated young adults and children? Does he consider them to be collateral damage or just a price worth paying? Mr. Speaker, I have to say the Honourable Lady, she started off uh, well, but her, her points that she made just completely degenerated into political point scoring. And she, she should know much better than to engage in scaremongering of the Scottish people, of the British people. And she has you know, no respect for what is happening and trying to uh, treat this whole issue uh, with, with, with a degree of respect and seriousness. I mean, she's using phrases like let it rip. Uh, if anything, Mr. Speaker, the only part of the UK where cases could be described as ripping would be in Scotland, where the case rate is higher than any other part of the UK. In fact, I think they have the seven of the ten highest hotspots in terms of number of cases throughout Europe, and the Honourable Lady should reflect on that. And then she claimed that, so, that, that I, I suggested that somehow that COVID 
is like flu. I've never said that. It would be complete nonsense for anyone to suggest that COVID is like flu. She should think about the millions of people across the world, the thousands that have died in the UK. I think how dare she suggest it's like flu in, in even raising that. Uh, the issue when it comes to flu, Mr. Speaker, is to say just as we have had to learn to live with flu, when in some years we've had 20,000 deaths, sadly, from flu, we have to learn to live with COVID. The Honourable Lady should reflect on what she said and stop playing political football with this serious yeah. issue. Yeah. Yeah. The House Speaker Bottom, eh? Mr. Speaker, can I welcome the Secretary of State in this role and say to him in public, but I hope I've said to him in private, that when he was Secretary of State for Housing, he's one of the few ministers to actually understand the plight of residential leaseholders, and I thank him for that, and I hope he'll do as well in this job as well. Can I put to him, that as well as the recognition of the National Health Service, it would be a good idea if we could find some way of recognising the role of teachers and their assistants in schools, who have done as much to keep the young people of this country up to their education and occupied, even though remotely. Many people have contributed. And can I finally put to him that I hope that, despite the occasional political remarks that any of us may make, that he will work with the other nations of the United Kingdom and with other nations around the world so that we can defeat this, the impact of this condition together. Mr Speaker, can I thank the Father of the House for his uh, kind comments? And, uh, and he may have heard me say earlier that the Education Secretary will say uh, much more tomorrow about the action we will be taking uh, around schools and educational settings, including uh, the removal of uh, bubbles, the bubbles requirement uh, from July the 19th uh, uh, as well. And, uh, and he's made an excellent point about working not just across the United Kingdom, uh, which I would tell him, despite what we just heard from the other, the, the, the previous Honourable Speaker just a moment ago, uh, there's great cooperation, and, uh, and that will, of course, continue, but also international cooperation, both through our leadership of the G7 and the COVAX Alliance. To Manira Wilson. Manira. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Secretary of State will be aware that for clinically extremely vulnerable people with compromised immune systems, double vaccination provides a much reduced level of protection compared to the rest of the population. He'll also be aware that pregnant women in their third trimester are considered clinically vulnerable. And many people in these groups are anxious about what today's announcements mean for them. So could he confirm what advice is being published for those who are clinically extremely vulnerable? And specifically, will he consider allowing pregnant women to have their second jab after 21 days. Uh, Mr. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, um, in term, of course there will be people that are, that are more vulnerable sadly to this virus that will be uh, concerned about step four. I, I entirely understand that and understand the, 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 the caution and uh, how they can be anxious. We will be publishing uh, further guidance along the lines that the Honourable Lady uh, has mentioned. Uh, with regards to her uh, question uh, on the second dose for uh, pregnant women, uh, I will have to take advice on that. Uh, just to warn colleagues that this, this statement will finish at 6 o'clock because of the need to go back to the debate on the uh, bill, so I would urge colleagues to be brief. Martin Vickers. Deputy Speaker. Um, the majority of my uh, constituents will certainly welcome the Secretary of State's statement, but in, uh, in that council area, the NHS digital rate at the moment is 591 per 100,000, which is considerably ahead of the national average, and that inevitably causes concern, particularly amongst the elderly and vulnerable groups. I've got full, full uh, confidence in the local NHS and council and other officials who are dealing with it, but it may, if, if it continues to worsen, uh, will the, uh, my right honourable friend meet with me and my honourable friend from Grimsby to discuss whether additional support and resources is required? Madam Deputy Speaker, I of course understand uh, the, the importance of the question from my honourable friend. Uh, and I have to tell him, as I've said uh, in my statement, I do believe the case rate nationally, and including in his own constituency, it will uh, worsen. But what, it, what is um, far more important is the hospitalisation rate and, uh, and the death rate. And he would have heard what I've said earlier, uh, but I would be more than happy to meet with him on any occasion to discuss these issues further. Uh, Jim Shannon. I'm on, Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Secretary of State for the health statement and for the approach by government centrally here uh, to drive the vaccine rollout across all of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland? 
better together as always. The approach as outlined by the government seems to be a sensible approach. Can the Secretary of State outline what discussions have taken place with his health counterpart in Northern Ireland to ensure that Northern Ireland cautiously and carefully moves forward at a similar pace as to here, bearing in mind our level of transmission in tandem with the need to be wise and wary? Can I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his remarks about the, the vaccine, as, and as he has said, it is a, a very successful UK-wide programme. The, the take-up of vaccinations in uh, Northern Ireland is, is just as high as any other part of the UK. Uh, I'm working closely uh, with my counterpart in Northern Ireland. We've already had uh, two discussions in, in one week, and we will be speaking on a regular basis and coordinating, and it's working very well. Andrew Jones. Speaker, uh, can I welcome my right honourable friend's statement? I think it will be greeted by a sense of relief across the country. The challenges that people have faced during this lockdown have been so profound. This success, of course, is only possible because of the vaccine rollout. So, will my uh, right honourable friend keep the pressure up to ensure as many people as possible are vaccinated? But whilst doing that, also uh, really put focus upon the significant catch up required on dealing with other health conditions, and particularly thinking about mental health and cancer. My honourable friend is right to raise this, and what he points out, and, and sometimes I think it's uh, missed by certain members of this House, is that the, the pandemic uh, has caused uh, many other non-COVID health problems, and uh, he's, he's mentioned uh, two of the most important, uh, which are the, the increased uh, problems with mental health. Uh, that we are seeing plenty of evidence of, and then also uh, with cancer, particularly cancer referrals. In fact, uh, I've been told that the, 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 the departmental officials think there's at least some 40,000 people that all in a normal year would have come forward for cancer referrals that did not come forward. And, uh, and this is just a reminder of why it's important for us to move back towards freedom and learning to live with COVID. Uh, we now go to Ben Lake. Yes, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Welsh Government has suggested that an easing of Welsh restrictions is unlikely before the July 19th, and any divergence in the rules applicable on either side of the border will raise questions of enforcement. Now, the responsibility for enforcing social distancing rules on trains is the responsibility of the British Transport Police. And so, what discussions has the Health Secretary had with the Secretary of State for Transport, and indeed the Welsh Government, regarding the status of restrictions on cross border rail travel? Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman know already that there is, uh, and this is understandable, there has been a, a difference in approach uh, between Wales and uh, England, and clearly there will continue uh, to be, and, and uh, we will continue to coordinate. I know that my predecessor coordinated uh, on a very regular basis with his Welsh counterpart, and also when it comes to transport, uh, we, the three of us, my Welsh counterpart and myself, will work uh, carefully uh, with the Secretary of State for Transport. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, the, it's hugely significant and welcome that the link between uh, cases and hospitalisation does seem to be broken by the vaccines. I'd like to echo what my honourable friend from Knaresborough has just said, Harold at Knaresborough. And can my right honourable friend assure me that notwithstanding the risks he's pointed out, such as potential variants and increased cases, that that focus, that the NHS will have the focus and the resources to continue to, to on that backlog, to, to bear down on the backlog, as my, right honourable, as my honourable friend said, when cases like cancer, which are scaring my constituents and, and everyone. Yes, Madam Deputy Speaker, I can give my honourable friend that assurance and the, the the, the backlog already at five million, and as I've said today, it's unfortunately uh, going to get a lot worse than that before it gets better. I think we can all understand why. Uh, but today's announcement, I think, would have certainly have helped uh, in, in our march to, to clear that uh, backlog. Uh, my old friend will know that the government has given significant additional funding in the billions to help with that, uh, but there will be a, a lot more to come in dealing with the priorities, especially cancer. Neil Handy. Speaker. Um, all of the warm words uh, from the Secretary of State towards the NHS at the top of his statement have been completely demolished by his attitude towards a breast cancer surgeon when he says that she should know better, when the reality is that she does know better. Yeah, yeah. And he should apologise to the yeah. right, Honourable Member from Central Ayrshire for those absolutely outrageous comments. And to use the escalation of cases in Scotland as a political tool is absolutely disgraceful. 
I want to talk about the... Madam Deputy Speaker, I do not agree with the Honourable Gentleman. Uh, we now go to Mark Harper. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I apologise for any uh, discourtesy to the House in not being able to be here in person. Um, the Prime Minister has confirmed that there will be contingency measures in place uh, for winter, uh, and even if they're not legal restrictions, they will have that effect on business. Can the Secretary of State confirm what they are and publish the detail so members can scrutinise them at the earliest opportunity? Madam Deputy Speaker, I can tell my honourable friend, the, uh, I believe what her, uh, he's referring to is that we will be keeping in place uh, contingency measures, uh, and in particularly for local authorities, the so-called number three regulations, at least until the end of September, in case those powers are needed. Uh, in the case of a, a local uh, breakout, and uh, of course there's, uh, there's no intention at this point that those powers will be used, but we believe that it is necessary uh, to have powers in place uh, uh, just in case. He would have heard me earlier uh, talk about the risk that still exists uh, from uh, new variants, and, uh, and, and that is the uh, plan, uh, but I'd be happy to discuss with him further. Uh, we now go to Caroline Lucas. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can the Secretary of State explain why, when other public health and safety measures aren't left up to individuals to decide, he thinks that's an appropriate approach to COVID? Failing to mandate mask wearing in stuffy, crowded places like public transport, where people are often pressed together for much longer than 15 minutes, risks high costs. Allowing people to choose whether or not to put others at risk is both reckless and unfair. If the freedom to pelt down the motorway at 100 miles an hour is restricted, because it poses risks to others. Why, with millions still unvaccinated, with some immunosuppressed, and with the risks of long COVID rising, why does the Health Secretary not apply the same logic to mask Secretary, work? Secretary of State. Madam Deputy Speaker, can I say to the Honourable Lady, I, I do uh, understand uh, where she's coming from, but uh, the important thing is we do have to learn to live with COVID. And that does mean that these restrictions that have been necessary uh, up until now that we have to at some point confront them and start removing them. And now is the best time to do that because of the defence that has been built by the vaccine. Sir Desmond Sway. We will never again sacrifice free enterprise, freedom of association and indeed freedom of worship in order to manage hospital admissions ever again, will we? Madam Deputy Speaker, I, I take it from that that my one honourable friend is pleased with today's announcements. Madam Deputy Speaker, some have, some have suggested that removing all restrictions uh, in the way that the Secretary of State has announced will create factories for new variants in parts of our communities. So what advice has the Secretary of State received from experts about the potential for new variants? And um, what contingencies has he planned for containing uh, such an outbreak if one were to occur? Madam Deputy Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman would have heard in my uh, statement earlier uh, that, that no course of action that we take now is without risk. I think the Honourable Gentleman uh, understands that. And uh, it is because there is still a pandemic, as I said, the pandemic is not over. Uh, that we, of course, will continue to first monitor for new variants. We will continue to have border restrictions uh, in place. We will continue to have uh, some test, trace and isolate procedures in place. And, uh, and I think these measures taken together with the success of the vaccine programme uh, is, the, is the best answer to his question. Uh, we now go to David Simmons, who I think is going to be audio only. Madam Deputy Speaker, one head teacher in my constituency tells a tale of losing more than 2,700 days of education, 390 children sent home, and zero transmission amongst pupils in school. So can my right honourable friend assure me that swift action will be taken to ensure that children can get back to school, head teachers can get back to teaching as soon as possible without the damage the current situation is creating? 
yes, Madam Deputy Speaker, I can give my honourable friend uh, that assurance, and the Education Secretary will be saying more uh, later this week, but I can uh, confirm to my honourable friend that uh, on July the 19th, it is our plan to remove bubbles and to end the requirement for early year setting schools or colleges to routinely carry out contact tracing, and we, I will have more to say on how we intend to exempt under 18s who are close contacts from the requirement to self isolate. Grady. Speaker, given that masks help reduce the spread not just of COVID but all kinds of respiratory diseases, isn't it important to avoid mixed messages and actually encourage everyone to continue that kind of practice and the likes of good hand hygiene? as a relatively routine part of a new normal to stop coughs and sneezes from spreading diseases. Chief State. Madam Deputy Speaker, I think uh, what the Honourable Gentleman is suggesting is that people should uh, have the freedom to wear a mask if they wish, but it should not be mandatory. It should not be mandated uh, by law. And there are countries, yeah, I lived in Singapore for three years, where uh, people uh, would wear masks if they were feeling unwell out of respect for others. And if people choose to do that here, that that will be a good thing. But it won't be a requirement uh, from the government. And, uh, and as I said earlier, that in, in certain settings, uh, in a crowded place, let's say on the tube in London, I think many people, despite not being a legal requirement, would choose to wear masks. Uh, we now go to Caroline Noakes. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The immunosuppressed want to know what the plan is for them. Will they be allowed tests for spike antibody levels on the NHS? And will they be able to get a booster before September if their antibody tests show they have no protection despite being vaccinated? State. Madam Deputy Speaker, it's an important question for my right honourable friend, and we are still uh, considering uh, what more we can do to, to, to give more confidence to the immunosuppressed, and we will be saying more in this shortly. Uh, we now go to Paul Blomfield. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, until recently, ministers were saying decisions would be, would be based on the link between infection and hospitalisation. But although the link has been weakened, it's not been broken. Hospitalizations are up 20% in the last week. They've doubled in a month. We all want the, to unlock the economy, but surely we should maintain barriers to infection where we can. The Secretary of State has said that wearing masks would be a good thing. So will he accept that requiring them on public transport, in essential shops and in similar locations would make sense and would reassure people? Eight. Madam Deputy Speaker, no one is suggesting that the link between cases and hospitalisation uh, because of the vaccines has been completely broken. Uh, what, what I've said, and, 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 and this is the, the, the fact based on the evidence that we are seeing, is that it has been significantly weakened, and that is uh, clear uh, from the data we're getting on a daily basis. If you look in uh, England, the case rate of 25,000, and I think less than 2,000 people uh, currently with COVID in hospital, which is far, far lower than what we've seen before when we had such a high case rate. Mary Robinson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm grateful to the Secretary of State for his, uh, his statement today, setting out the, the way forward. In the 150 years since the foundation of Cheadle's Together Trust, it's championed and cared for people from 18 to 30 years old with disabilities. Meeting with their dedicated team last week, it was clear that having no navigated the challenges of COVID, they're preparing for the future. As the government looks to set out a new vision for the health and social care, for health and social care, can the Secretary of State reassure voluntary and third sector bodies like Together Trust that they will have their invaluable contribution recognised and be included as equal partners in its design? Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm very happy to give my honourable friend that uh, assurance. The Cheadle Together Trust and many other uh, third party and voluntary organisations across the country uh, really stepped up during the pandemic when the country most needed it. And uh, we will continue to work with them. And I think at, the, at a suitable moment, we should give them the recognition that they deserve. Evan. Madam Deputy Speaker, it's a dereliction of duty by the Secretary of State for Health to tell people to live with the virus whilst denying people the basic financial and other support that they need. In two weeks' time, with restrictions lifted, there could be over 60,000 cases per day. The government says it will surge further. Huge numbers are denied the self-isolation payment. Tens of thousands of people each day will be forced to isolate on statutory sick pay of just £96 per week. So I ask the Secretary of State for Health, 
Could he live on £96 per week? Madam Deputy Speaker, it's right that we provide support, including financial uh, support, uh, for those uh, that are isolating and, and finding things difficult. And uh, we will uh, continue to, to do so, and we will keep that under review. Dr Luke Evans. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'd like to draw the House's attention to a story over the weekend of three batches of AstraZeneca vaccines affecting five million people and their prospects of travelling to the EU. I must declare an interest. I've vaccinated many people with this uh, batch and indeed had the batch myself. So can you confirm that this is purely a bureaucratic issue, that the vaccines are exactly the same and update the House over what talks he's had with the EU to resolve this problem? First, can I thank my honourable friend for the work that he's personally been doing uh, during the pandemic. Um, and, and what I can tell you, all doses that are, are used in the UK have been subject to very rigorous uh, safety and quality checks, including individual batch testing and physical site inspections. And uh, this is all done by the medical regulator, MHRA. We now go to Ben Bradshaw. Given Americans and other Europeans have already been free to travel again for some time, and given we were promised a vaccine dividend, when can the millions of British families separated from loved ones abroad, or simply who want a foreign holiday, expect to receive the same freedoms back that other Europeans and Americans already enjoy? Madam Deputy Speaker, I can tell the Honourable Gentleman very, very soon, and the Secretary of State for uh, Transport will have more to say on this very shortly. Steve Brown. Thank you. Last week I said I wanted to see a change of policy as well as tone from the new Secretary of State, and we have that today, or at least an indication of such, for next Monday, and, I, and I'm grateful for it. Can I ask my right honourable friend to give us some insight into his thinking about the future of test and trace? Surely it can't continue as now, with contacts of contacts, even if double vaccinated, forced into isolation for 10 days at a time with all the knock-on effects that that has for society and economy. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I will be making a statement to Parliament on just that issue and I think I will probably make it tomorrow. We now go to Debbie Abrahams. Madam Deputy Speaker, last December, Professor Sir Michael Marmot uh, revealed that the high and unequal COVID death toll across England was down to historic structural inequalities that successive Conservative governments have allowed to go unchecked. And last week, he quantified this and showed that Greater Manchester had a 25% higher COVID death, death toll because of these structural socioeconomic inequalities. So when will the sec health sector deliver on the Prime Minister's promise to me in January in terms of implementing Sir Michael's recommendations to address these inequalities in my constituency and others and will ensure that we build back fairer? Secretary of State. Madam Deputy Speaker, it's, a, it's an important issue that the Honourable Lady has raised and uh, we have seen sadly through this pandemic because of various inequalities up and down the country, uh, some people have uh, suffered a lot more than others. So it is a, an important point. We do uh, need to do more. We do need to all collectively uh, learn from this. And I want to give her the assurance that I know that Public Health England and the, and the CMO, the Chief Medical Officer, uh, are looking into this and will be reporting to ministers shortly. Final question, Hugh Merriman. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. I welcome this statement from the Secretary of State. Can I just ask for clarity? Um, the legal requirement to wear face coverings, including on public transport, it states we advise this as a voluntary measure for crowded and enclosed spaces. Should that be crowded, enclosed spaces? And does he intend to put out guidance? And what will he do to ensure that private operators can't mandate it um, outside of that guidance? Thank you. Madam Deputy Speaker, I can tell my old friend it's, uh, the, the guidance is, is really asking people to use their common sense. That if there are many other people around them, uh, particularly if the, if the people around them might be more vulnerable, let's say older people, uh, or for some reason people that may be uh, as a group uh, unvaccinated, uh, then we're just really saying use your common sense. And I think everyone in Britain uh, will, will do uh, just that. In terms of uh, private settings, it will be up to private businesses, you know, shops, uh, for example, uh, to decide uh, what they wish to do. I thank the Secretary of State uh, for his statement and will suspend the House for one minute to make 
arrangements for the next business.